and welcome to another episode of the Trucking Risk and Insurance Podcast, where we talk about trucking, trucking risk, and trucking insurance. So with that, Mr. John Farquhar, my co-host, take it away. Hey, thanks, Chris. How you doing? So we have a, a special guest today. I don't know if you know who she is. She's, she's a nice lady. Her name is Lisa Arsenal, and she's with Stabler Insurance. And interesting enough, Lisa has been in the industry 35 years, but is only 36 years old. Amazing. Amazing. I want to know, I want to know I love your what you're doing. I want to know what you're doing. How, how do you stay so young, Lisa? You know what? Filters are wonderful. I'm not going to like this in-person meetings when we get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. No. So well, anyway, so, so we're going we're to talk about some insurance stuff today. Chris. I was going to say, we've gotten back to in-person meetings, Lisa. I saw you just a few weeks ago at an, an in-person event. And then we had to go play whack. Well, I can't say that. Uh, yeah. We had to go play golf. <laughs> had to go play golf. Yes. Well, funny enough, during the pandemic in 2020, and of course this year as well, the only way I got to uh, do anything in person was golf. It was oh, wow. with uh, other insurance um, colleagues, clients, and uh, prospects. So, I mean, for all of the um, the rigmarole that we've gone through and everything, golf was considered safe, and uh, that's how I did in person for a year and a half. Cool. And hey, it was outdoors, so it was perfect. Yeah. So you got to do some it. things. You know, somebody's got to do the hard work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, because the rest of us are slackers at thirty-five hours a week. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of an insight. If somebody didn't watch your podcast this morning or your live cast this morning, that was funny. Yeah, saying you work, you used to work 50 hours, 50, 60 plus hours, and then you went to work for an insurance company and was drilled down to 35. And I'm like, whoa, part timers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's what I was asked to work. And I yeah. did it. I don't think I, there was a week that I actually worked 35. It was always. 40 plus just because oh for sure but anyways we are talking about insurance today and mm -hmm. how to game the system no mm -hmm. how to not game the oh, system you're not, you're not. <laughs> oh <laughs> so close chris so close i liked so, it better my way if be i more. if if i was a trucking company i want to know how to game the system yeah. You don't want to game the system if you're a trucking company. <laughs> game the system has very negative connotation. And why wouldn't Ooh. I want to game the system? Well, because when happen? you game a system, when, when you game a system, that means that you're playing outside of the rules. You're coloring outside of the box. And um, that's not what we want for insurance. And unfortunately, that's what we're, we have been seeing. It's insidious to our industry. And it just seems to have become the norm more so than the exception in the last few years, um, which has called for task force task forces to be created, um, like-minded colleagues in the industry to, you know, form ranks to combat this sort of thing. And I'm happy to say that um, it's, it's moved the needle. Mm. Are you going to yes, keep, us, I'm, I, keep us in, in suspense or are you going to describe yeah. how it moved yeah. the needle? So, I, you know what, so, sometimes when you talk and you say a lot of words, it's kind of nice to let it rest for a minute in case other people want to say words. I've been told, I've been told I didn't do that enough, so. <laughs> what I'm seeing or what has been happening and the reasons for the task force um, was mainly um, built around the facility association. For those who don't know what it is, um, in Ontario, it's mandatory to have insurance. And whenever a government body makes something mandatory, they have to provide a facility for which you can get that um, thing that they've made mandatory, hence the name Facility Association. It is um, a group of uh, insurers that must contribute to this facility association pool in order to have reserves and available money to pay claims. And it is what we call an insurer of last resort. 
So if the regular market will not take you for any number of reasons, um, exposure, experience, bad exposure, bad experience, high risk, you will be sent to a facility association because of the mandatory requirement to have insurance. <clears throat> it was originally created more so for um, private passenger vehicles. And it was originally meant for people who had uh, history such as DUIs, um, where a regular market wouldn't be wanting to offer insurance to somebody who had a DUI. Hence, the last resort. You, you know, I mean, it, it's a good, it's a good place to be if you need to rehabilitate your reputation, your experience. Things happen. Um, you know, if you've had three or four accidents and, you know, not terrible catastrophic ones, but too many for a regular market to take you in, you need to have a facility in which to go and get insurance. So that's how it was born out. And it was really, I mean, that was the intent of it. And it was working recently. And I, I, it pains me to say this, but insurance individuals such as brokers have found that commercial trucking can benefit from the facility association mm -hmm. in a way that is gaming the system. Now, as we know, facility association last resort is going to be much higher premiums, three, four, five times what a regular market would offer. Sorry, for cars, just, for private passenger vehicles. Just before you go ahead, I just want to make sure that everybody heard that three, four, or four perhaps five times higher than the regular market. Sorry, yeah. I just wanted to <clears throat> throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and see, here's, here's the conundrum is, is that you are afforded the facility because it's mandatory and you have to have it and everything, but some people shouldn't be driving. And so if you've had three or four accidents or two DUIs and you still have a license, you're going to pay. You're gonna, and you're going to need to pay three, four, or five times. If you've been put into facility facility for other reasons, such as a bad loss experience, or you're going to have to pay double the amount because you're double the risk for them because you've proven that you have accidents. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's all it's it's relative. It, it really is. Um, what it, what is a hardship for some of the commercial operators is you know they are first year operators. They have never had a CVOR or level two CVOR their own authorities. And their only option as an owner operator is to go to facility because our insurers over the past few years have been a bit hard by new businesses coming in and they're either what we call chameleon accounts or they're sliding out from a bad CVOR and getting a new one and thinking, oh, I'm going to start fresh again, but it's the same guy. And so our insurers can't really tell the good guys from the bad guys, not on paper. So they made the decision, the business decision to say, if your CVOR has not been enforced, attached to an insurance policy in the last three years, you're not getting insurance from me either. And they had to do that to protect themselves and to protect their um, capacity, their, their capital and their clients that, that, you know, they have on their, on their books. So that's where I feel the hardship is. And that's where, where I feel bad is, is new, operators, new owner operators who want to be an entrepreneur and actually were the light bread of trucking from the beginning of the reg. And uh, they cannot, they can't, they have to go into facility. So, and I can cite examples of a fellow going, you know, our South and new CVOR and he was rated at $68,000 for his tractor and his trailer. Oh. How, how, can these guys, how, how can these guys afford such a premium? We're, we're complaining that Marsons are not big enough to begin with. And, and that's the thing, most of the fellows that come to me and I have to tell them that, that story or give them that premium, they don't. They decide that, and my advice then is to lease on with a reputable fleet, mm -hmm. with a really good operating record and a great onboarding and um, follow through a mentorship and, and all of that kind, get your years there. Get your three years. You can still be an owner operator. You can still own your vehicle. You're just leased under a fleet, but it's giving you the experience that in three years, now you can say, I've been an owner operator for three years. I have my own CVOR. I haven't been using it. It's been dormant, not, you know, tell the truth. However, you've now got your three years as an owner op with a CVOR. So that's, you know, but, but when we're talking about gaming the system, those are the good guys. Those are the guys that are doing the things right. 
<laughs> when we're talking about gaming the system, now we're gonna we're gonna talk about guys that have trucks in Ontario, which is probably the highest rated facility province in Canada, um, operating and being dispatched out of Ontario, that have have been given some bad advice. Some some advice from unfortunately some of my colleagues that will advise them to open a company in another province which has lower facility rates. Hence the Alberta Limited companies, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Um, you guys see them all the time, I'm sure, when you go in and you're, you're, you say, well, why are you registered in Alberta? They don't dispatch out of Alberta. All right. they're to show their major miles are in Ontario and then south of the border. And But they've been advised to go there and then they get raided out of the Alberta facility book which is totally unfair because they're not traveling in Alberta. They're traveling in Ontario and they should be paying Ontario premiums. Now, so what happened with the task force? Oh, sorry. And now no, I was going to say, <laughs> what are the changes? Because you've mentioned that there's a task force. Are they tackling right. this, this issue? Well, sorry. Yes. So as of November, sorry, can you, what is this task force? Can you explain who it is or? Yes. So the facility liberty? association, what it get gets money it, it's by other insurers so on the task force are insurers who are paying into this facility pool insurance brokers uh trucking associations such as eota and um just like-minded insurance individuals that really push the push put the push on the facility association facility association was there the mto was there like you know there's um really some really great stakeholders so what came of it was because it, before in facility, all you had to do was give a truck ownership and an abstract and say, mm -hmm. and tell them where you went yep. and say, give me insurance. So with the task force and all the talking that they did and all the strides that they made, November, 2020, now you must submit international fuel tax returns to show where you go, where your exposure is. You have to give the abstract and loss experience from where you come from mm. and your level two CBR. So now the facility is acting more like an insurance company does where they're vetting you. Mm -hmm. So if you have an, uh, an Alberta limited company and all you have to show your concentrated miles in Ontario and South, they're going to say, mm, you're going to get rates on t in Ontario. We have to rate you where your exposure is. Prior to that, there was no exposure rating. <laughs> yeah, so they should be applauded. That task force was amazing. Yeah. Can, can a facility insurance uh, decline, provide coverage? I'm sorry? Can the facility association decline coverage? No. So, so it's, it's all about the only way to drive it up is with the price. Well, and that's it. And I mean, that's basically been a principle of insurance for a long time, right? I mean, you surcharge on yeah. different criteria, file rules and rates, right? So we'll take you if, yeah. and we'll charge you this for that. So, but the facility is, is like way more. <laughs> so what, so I believe facilities through Alberta now, they've really, they've really done their job in Alberta and they're moving on to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Good. Excellent news because. Yeah. And you know, when not even, you don't have to be on the task force. You, you can even just be a broker that says, why am I getting all these calls from guys? And their lost friends are all coming out of Alberta or their lost friends all say facility Nova Scotia. Yeah. So then you have a frank conversation with the insured and say, "Why? Well, because my broker told me if I went out there, mm -hmm. I get cheaper. But now I'm yeah, and I'm like, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get caught, catching, and you get catching caught. up on them. Yep. And sorry, uh, one negative comment. It's about flipping time. The facility association. Well, yeah. Lisa, you're the insurance expert. So if I say this incorrectly, please. Pipe in and, and do it, say it the way it, it truthful. Um, it's my understanding that all the regular market insurance companies pay into the facility market so that the facility market can exist. And so 
if we're abusing the facility market, then all of us who pay car insurance or commercial trucking insurance, whatever, our rates go up to compensate. Well, the insurer has to get the money somewhere. Right. I mean, it doesn't grow on trees for them. So everybody, in effect, everyone is paying. Right. And that's not fair. I'm sorry. No. Raise your hands if you think your car insurance rates are too high. You know, like... But yeah, but when you talk about fair, you have to you have to think too. what's fair to an insurer that hasn't had a loss ratio under 100 percent in 10 years. That's not fair. No, but they stay and they're still here. So, you you know, kind of they're not you know, they're not they're in it to make money as well um, and survive. But honestly, I don't know of any regular business that would constantly break even or lose money for 10 years that stuck around and kept doing the same thing. And our traditional truck guys have done that. Well, Mm -hmm. and what some of our listeners may not appreciate is the fact that insurance companies have shareholders and those investors expect a return Mm -hmm. on their investment, a positive return. (laughs) So, you know, they, they have people to answer to too. And, um, you know, let, can we deviate a little bit and talk about, um, and I, I don't think this was planned. I know it wasn't planned. It, I mean, this whole conversation really wasn't planned other than we're talking about facility. But why wouldn't a trucking company go to Manitoba, as an example, uh, a province that has government-run insurance? After mm-hmm. all, I'm told it's way cheaper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that used to be the old line too about going to the U.S. Do you remember the guys used to always say, "I'm going down to the, to the U.S." Their rates are so cheap. You know, well, I'm here to tell you, they're not. Yay. And the same, you know, I um, I have a couple, you know, some fleets that operate terminals out of the U.S. And I work very closely with the U.S. brokers, so I see the policies, I see the premiums. They're not much different than ours. Wow. And why wouldn't you go to Manitoba or a government run? They're cheaper. No, they're not. And then you have to deal, and in commercial, you have to deal with their underlying or their primaries with their plate. Then you have to get access because you're a trucking company that's doing north-south. You're going to need way more than the province can provide. So now you've got another broker. Now you've got another insurer. It's not, it's not really that easy, and it's not cheaper. No. Well, and I understand that those uh, government-run programs through certain provinces, uh, those groups are much more diligent in making sure you have a location in that province uh, other than just plates and a P.O. box. Well, I mean, again, stories. Uh, Ten years ago, a bunch of everybody, ooh, let's go to Manitoba, Mm -hmm. you know, let's run out to B.C. And they all get kicked back, too. Yeah. Because if you physically, having a P.O. box isn't going to cut it. So then they're like, oh, I got a terminal. My brother-in-law is the <laughs> resident there. Because you have to prove to the government that you're contributing to the to the um, community. Yeah, well, his, yep. his brother's a baker. And he goes and picks up mail there every once a week. You know, they've got auditors just like we do at the MTO. And they can show up, spot yeah. check, and they can knock on a terminal. If nobody's there, mm-hmm. I was going to say, the shed in his backyard doesn't quite make it as a terminal. <laughs> hey, Lisa, you used one um, phrase earlier that I, I, can you please define it just in case somebody doesn't know what a chameleon fleet is? Mm, good, good question. Yes, our lovely chameleon accounts. Well, yeah. it, well, what it, is it's, that? It's derived, it's derived from exactly the, the chameleon who changes its colors to suit its surroundings. So what they will do is I have ABC trucking. I run my, my level two up to 94%. I have no safeties in place. Uh, my SMS has got alerts all over the place. My ISS is 90. Oof. I, I, I got to get away from this. I, I've got to get away from this, from the name, from the history, from the, from the scores. So then he gets brother, uncle, daddy, or whoever to go in and write their CBOR test, go on the articles of corporation as a director or secretary, 
and they are the front of the company. However, management hasn't changed, vehicles haven't changed, and culture hasn't changed. So there's our little chameleon. Once a bright purple little penny over here is now a little green penny over here. But nothing's changed, and he's going to do that again. So we are combating that as well. Well, sure. And I mean, and you've heard the saying, I've got a CVR, i got a level two in my back pocket just in case you need it. Mm -hmm. And guys, yeah. guys have behaved like that for years. Yeah. But here's the thing. The MTO now cross-references VINs, plates. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this will get out. And then they'll get new plates. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, you know, get a different track traded in for the same model. So the VIN's different. Like, that'll happen, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. for now... We are combating it through cross-referencing because I can tell you now our little purple penny who goes to get his CVOR under his little green penny and they compare VINs or addresses or phone numbers and they had a conditional under 94% safety violation rate, mm -hmm. their new little green penny gets a conditional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. off the hop. Yeah. And as we know, insurers won't take a new venture with a conditional CVR. Right, right. And so we're to work for following the breadcrumbs and we're trying to, you know, pick them up as fast as we can and then, you know, put Smarties down <laughs> for their next little. No, the, the MTO, I think, has done a great job in reducing those chameleon fleets because they're watching, as you say, the trucks, okay. the trailers, even I've the drivers like yep. when they all move from one CVR to another that raises a flag at the MTO yeah. and so yeah. they've done a great job in helping reduce that I don't know that it's eliminated mm -hmm. although I have to say in the last five years I really haven't seen it anymore um, but no because they yeah. diligently like, yeah because it got the word got out if you're going to get a conditional brand new shiny with a conditional what's the point what's it why go mm -hmm. through it yeah. Now, you know what our next step is? Honestly, I, our next step is MTO talking to finance, IFTA. Because as mm -hmm. you know, we're self-reporting when it comes to kilometric travel, yeah. which is another gaming of the system. So we up our kilometric travel to lower our violation rate, right? I hope I'm not teaching anybody anything. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is pretty much common knowledge, but mm, but anyway, so you're if gonna we, get phone, if you're going to get phone calls now. Jeez, how do you do that? <laughs> really? What did you mean by that? What did you mean by that again? No, but if we could have if the talking to MTO, there'd be no self-reporting. Yeah, MTO would use a kilometric process. travel right from the IFTAs. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's coming. Not everybody uses IFTA though. Um, those who stay in Ontario, for instance, wouldn't. Sure. Um, however, what's coming next year? ELD. Yay! Mm -hmm. uh, for Ontario-only companies. Yeah. And yeah. so it'll be interesting to see if during an MTO audit, for instance, they get those reports and start mm -hmm. comparing yep. those reports to... I, I strongly suspect they will, obviously. Um and also, too, though, but we're, we're, we're starting to, to the discussion that's been started about sharing data. Mm -hmm. So if, if, our, if our guys would share data with their insurers, well, it's only a matter of time before the MTO asks yep. for data to be shared as well. Tap into that. And resource. look around at the private passenger vehicles. Mm -hmm. On Lia and, you know, pay what you the liberty, just pay for what you need. And mm -hmm. we're not far off from that. Mm -hmm. And that's data sharing. Yeah, and I, I think you're going to see that come quickly to the commercial industry. Mm -hmm. if, if you are truly operating a good fleet, and this is going to help reduce your insurance, yeah. why wouldn't you? Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. I just, I just went through a renewal where we were virtual, and uh, one of my fleets shared their screen of Pete speed gauge where it shows mm -hmm. the, the hard braking, the hard left turns, mm -hmm. um, all that kind of And he was sharing the videos with my insurer partner and they were just like, wow, like I would love to get my hands on that. And he's like, anytime you want it. Mm -hmm. the, the sad part is, it, it sounds like it's a lot of effort 
on, on behalf of the motor carrier to game the system here. Where if they invested half that effort into putting into place good safety programs, training processes, and managing the risk on a regular basis, they do a lot better. It would be much better. It's more upfront work. It's more uh, diligent and, and it's more of a responsibility, but gaming the system is called, is all, all about shortcuts and it's the gratification as in revenue. But so when you do all the things that you just to, talked about. Yeah, but, but it's a constant process to keep that, that, that going. Whereas if, if we implement good controls and best practices, and just maintain that, it's a lot less work down the road. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And now the chameleon is getting caught more and more often and the conditional CVRs are being issued. They're going to see that I can't keep doing this because guys have done mm -hmm. it three, four, five times yeah. before they're yeah. actually shut out. Right. That's not happening now. So they can maybe do it two or three times. But right. why do it at all? And I get yeah, your point, exactly. John. I really do. I agree. And, and so they'll get there. You know, five times, three times, two times, okay, let's just do it right. <laughs> well, especially after they pay three to five times more for, for insurance through facility, well, when if I just exactly. clean up my act, I could have saved a ton of money, if not made money. Exactly. It's the long play. Yeah, and, and let, let's be honest. They could have hired one of us, John, to help yep. them and, and put money is. in our yep. pocket. And, and, and more money there back in theirs. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So... You but, know, and, and, and a broker like Lisa, they could have got highly educated in this whole process. So there you go. The, the three here, three amigos should be just be hired by these people regularly. Simple as that. Oh, my God. I'm so glad we didn't rehearse anything because I would have let that in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys. I tell you. So we're not gaming the system. We're No, we don't want to game the system. We want to work within it and we want everybody to do the same thing because for the 60 percent that are working the system the 40 are making it that much more expensive and harder for the 60 to to, to go and do their day-to-day -day right yeah. is that just an example like did you just pull those numbers out of the air 60 40 or is that a true known ratio it's not it's not a statistic in my experience i believe that it's not far off oh uh, you've shocked me in that only 60% are doing it the way it should be done. I would have thought, mm -hmm. quite honestly, it would have been like 80 and then 10 or 20% were, you, yeah. no? Would have, would have hoped so. I, I would, it used to be like that, Chris. Honestly, you would get, you know, the renegades that, that thought, you know, I'm smarter than, I'm the smartest person in the room and uh, I'll never get yeah. caught and, <laughs> and I can do this. And it used to be few and far between. It used to be the exception. That's true. But unfortunately, word of mouth and being taught, like for an example, think about this. So even in, in my industry, so a broker is a seasoned broker and they've been in the business for 30 years and they are, they are tasked with mentoring and bringing up new producers. Mm -hmm. So they're working on a 21B fleet and uh, they say to this young fella, Hold it. What's a 21B, just in case somebody doesn't know? Sorry. Sorry. So they're working, working on a fleet basis where they don't have to report each and every driver or tractor throughout the term. They have a fleet. But now they do have to report to their insurers, say, on a quarterly basis. So say this ABC fleet has 200 trucks. And the seasoned broker says to the, the young fellow coming up, listen, when they send you their list of vehicles, and drivers take off the bottom 20 the newly the newest and take off the bottom 20 and then you send that into the insurance company so the young fella believes he's being taught an sop standard operating mm -hmm. procedure right so he doesn't know any different because because he's mm -hmm. being mentored he's being brought up i guarantee and from fact my own experience i know it's being done and that's terrifying to me Sure. And that's hiding units to save premium. And when I wow. see the 60 40 count, that's a lot of it. Hmm. Well, and that's unfortunately kind of a, an approach that we've seen with mentoring new drivers. Shortcut, 
put make it quick get him on the road as quick as possible give him what he needs right. to know just to get going and get the keys in his yes. hands and down the road he goes it's it's so true so the onus is on us who have been in the industry we're the right doers the right fighters the right thinkers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that should be, you know, we're, and we do, we are. I, I have two mentees working in, with me right now. And that's like, here's, I'm going to tell you what we do. And I'm going to tell you, here's what you're going to hear that other, because I mean, there's a young brokers network. They talk to each other. I, I do not want my mentees listening to mm -hmm. any of that and having that, you know, creep in to their day to day. But the young mentees that, that are working for that broker that's giving them this information, like it's it's a shame for them. They don't know. They don't know what they don't know. Well, as you say, if they are taught that way, they think it's the norm and the correct way mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, Lisa, last word. It we're heading up on thirty minutes already. I can't believe it. Wow. She talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Man. You can hit him later. <laughs> I know you're not in the same room, but it's coming soon that you'll be in the same room. <laughs> Just I save it up, it Lisa. My, my last words would be, you play games, you work a system. You don't do both. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. Johnny, you want to wrap this one up? You know what? Uh, do it the right way. And the return on investment will pay for itself. It'll, it'll come back tenfold, uh, but you're just going to pay. It, cheaters always, always lose. Thank you, Johnny. And that's it for this week on the Trucking Risk and Insurance wow. Podcast. Yay, Yay! Thank you to our guest, Lisa. Thanks Arslo for having me. Of Thank Stabler you. Insurance. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate cool. your time. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate you. Thanks for well, having me. And a huge thank you to our guest, Lisa Arsenault, and my co-host, Mr. Johnny Farquhar. Thanks for tuning in, John, of Summit Risk Solutions. That's it for this week. If you're getting value, please like and subscribe because it really does help the channel so much. Uh, safety dogs out. See you next week.